Following the assassination of Imam Ali, son of Abu Talib, and the killing of Imam al Hussein, son of Ali, the community of the followers of the Imams, known as the Shia Imamiya, and in later times the Twelvers, came under grave threat. The reigning powers at the time, the Umayyads, led a severe campaign of religious persecution against the nascent Shi'i Imami community. As the years passed, the Imams of the Twelve Shi'as went to great lengths to safeguard the communal well-being and social standing of the Shi'i community. Similarly, the Imams led a concerted effort to preserve and disseminate the religious and legal theological teachings of the Shi'i tradition and to defend Shi'i creedal matters against internal and external detractors. Few historians disagree with the notion that the reign of the Umayyads and the killing of Al-Hussein at their hands sent shockwaves throughout the Muslim world. Discontent and severe opposition to the Umayyads abound specially in those regions where Shi'i communities lived in large numbers. The popular socio-political discontent against the Umayyads turned militant, when in the year 750 AD, the Bani Abbas, a proto-Shi'i movement in the south of Iraq, led a revolution and brought the Umayyad reign to an end. In the period that followed, the Shi'i community and its Imams, particularly Muhammad al-Baqir and Jafar al-Sadiq, enjoyed the newly found but relative freedom to promote Shi'i learning and the freedom to articulate Shi'i theological positions without much political suppression by the incumbent powers. Indeed, in the early Abbasid period, Al-Baqir and Al-Sadiq were widely recognized as the preeminent religious authorities in the realms of theology and jurisprudence. Determined to spread the teachings of the Shi'i tradition, the Imams relied on their companions and close networks of supporters and loyalists. Thanks to these networks of supporters and loyalists, the intricacies of Shi'i learning and intellectual traditions reached far and beyond the immediate milius of Medina and Kufa. Soon, the Shi'i networks of the Imams developed into a community of scholarship, and with the socio-political changes taking effect, the nature of Shi'i scholarship transformed. It was during this period that we saw the introduction of the theory of Ijtihad among the Shi'i learned class. There was a tendency that preferred to interpret the legal maxims of the Imams, the traditions of the Imams, literally. And they were critical of the use of reason as a tool to help one understand the scriptures. There was another tendency which preferred to exercise some reason to understand the scriptures. In fact, what this tendency wanted to do is to analyze the collections of hadiths attributed to the Imams and from them derive general principles which can then be used to discover um, Islamic law or Shi'i law. أن الإمام الصادق عليه السلام كان يخاطب خلص أصحابه فيقول لهم إن علينا الأصول وعليكم الفروع أو يقول لواحد من أصحابه إني أحب أن تجلس في المسجد لتفتي الناس والإفتاء اجتهاد لكن هذا الاجتهاد كان ضيقا uh, There were some individuals who were identified as um, uh, certainly issuing their independent judgments based on what they knew from the Imams. Um, and, you know, people talk about various individuals who are like that. Um, uh, Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman is a very good example of someone who was uh, pronouncing both on, the on theological issues but also on matters of, of what we would now call fiqh. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were practicing ijtihad. As you can imagine, there were disputes. The traditionists accuse the um, rationalists, so to speak, um, of exercising ra'i, opinion, 
of engaging in qiyas, analogy. And they did, did this deliberately. It was a form of polemic because they had heard the imams condemn qiyas, analogy, because qiyas was usually associated with Sunni legal methodology. They had also heard the imams condemn, condemn those who use independent judgment, ra'i, um, in the hope um, that they would use these traditions to undermine the rationalists. Now, according to some of the traditions we have, the imams made it clear to those rationalists, in fact, they encouraged them to derive general principles from the scriptures, not just in matters of law, but also in theology. And the term ijtihad, certainly in the early period, was um, was used in a very negative manner. And this uh, negative approach to the term ijtihad remained till relatively late, uh, in the sense that it remained certainly until well into the 10th century and arguably even into the 11th century. And that's because ijtihad as an, what we now understand as independent legal reasoning based on certain sort of qualifications, etc., was primarily associated with the practice of Sunnis, and particularly with the development of the Sunni legal schools. So it was considered to be an alternative structure of authority and understanding of the faith, an alternative to what the Imams were presenting. And so for that obvious reason, ijtihad was considered to be unacceptable and illegitimate as a form of understanding what God's law was. A system of socio-religious networks developed during the time of the later Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Its primary function was to cater for the ever-growing population of followers, as well as to circumvent the watchful eye of the Abbasid spy networks. In the subsequent generations following the death of As-Sadiq, there existed far-reaching networks and communities of representatives known as Wukala. Given that in previous times the Imamiya lived in Medina, this system was not only effective, but also allowed the Shia directed access to their Imams. Religious persecution of the Imams intensified as years went by, with the Imams and their followers coming under increasing scrutiny and social marginalization. The religious and social persecution was especially pronounced in the time of Imam al riva and even more so at the time of his great-grandson and the 11th Imam Hassan al Askari. It became almost impossible for the Shia faithful to have direct links to the Imam in person, making the system of representation, the Wakala, a necessary but effective alternative. Those who uh, were authorized certainly to, uh, to narrate from the Imams uh, and particularly to provide guidance on practices, and this is certainly true for uh, communities which were remote. The time of the life of Imam Musa ibn Jafar salam, was that whilst he was in the prison, there was one person who was communicating with the Imam. He was allowed and permitted to visit the Imam in the prison and then bring the stifta'at, the questions, people's questions about religious matters, uh, to bring it to the Imam inside the prison. And of course, we remember or history records two prominent figures here. One was the Ali ibn Suwaid. Ali ibn Suwaid, uh, in the history, like Kashi, uh, who uh, wrote Ikhtiyar Ma'rifat al Rijal, uh, he clearly says that he was taking the questions from people to the Imam and getting the answers to them. Al Mufaddal ibn Umar. Al Jufi was one of them uh, who was appointed by the Imam to deal with religious dues, with administration, with people's problems, this is their social whatever I mean involvement. And these two namely were trusted by the Imam السلام, and were communicating and they were linking the nation and people with Imam. In the times of, say, from Imam Sadiq to Imam Rida, uh, things were certainly on the whole very open, uh, which meant that the structures which were being established then, then had a continuity. Um, so that was partly about teachings, that was partly about setting up 
uh, structures for the collecting of, of Homs. Uh, of, of course, those who were then recognized as agents were quite powerful, especially in the later period where access to the Imams was difficult. Uh, for example, when they were based in Samarra. Uh, Samarra was certainly not anywhere central to the Shi'i communities. It wasn't the Hejaz, it wasn't southern Iraq, um, it wasn't uh, you know, various other areas where the communities were. So that period in Samarra was particularly problematic. Uh, and of course, um, that coincided with uh, times of persecution as well. The Wakil system became most significant, necessary and relevant during the time of the four special representatives. These representatives differ from all previous Wakils. In the past, the system of Wakala did not have sufficient preventative measures to ensure selected Wakils were morally upright. As such, some Wakils harboured political ambition and turned corrupt, while others were entrapped by the snares of materialism. Some established rival religious groups to undermine the Imams, such as the example of Ali ibn Abi Hamza al battaini a wakil of the seventh Imam. Be that as it may, the four representatives were, nevertheless, considered trustworthy, and they only spoke on behalf of the twelfth Imam through the use of tawqi'at, or letters signed directly by the Imam. The first of the four wakils of the twelfth Imam was Uthman, son of Sa'id al-Asadi. At the age of eleven, he entered the service of the ninth Imam, Muhammad al-Jawad, celebrated for his erudition and piety. Later, Uthman ibn Sa'id became the representative of Ali al-Hadi, the 10th Imam, and shortly after, the latter's son, Hassan al-Askari. After an illustrious career in the service of three Imams, ibn Sa'id became the first of four special representatives of Imam al-Mahdi, when the latter went into occultation. Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri شخصيه مميزه نعرف نمط شخصيته يقول اجوا جماعه للامام سلام الله عليه قالوا له يا ابن رسول الله احنا عندنا مسائل لمن نسالها عندنا اموال لمن نعطيها قال ابن عثمان العمري الثقه المامون على الدين والدنيا ومدحه بعدين يقول هو وكيلي وابنه وكيل ابني هذا الإمام العسكري. After the death of Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Asadi, his son, known as Abu Ja'far, was appointed as the second special representative of Imam al-Mahdi. Abu Ja'far was a trusted companion and a loyal friend of the 11th Imam, and was a man recognized for his grasp of Shi'i learning and religious piety. It is reported that when Abu Ja'far performed ritual washing and burying of his father's deceased body, he received a letter of consolation from the 12th Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi. According to Shi'i belief, when a Shi'i faithful receives guidance and direct communication from the Imam in person, this happening is considered miraculous. For Abu Ja'far, this was an unmistakable sign that he was to be the successor of his father acting as the second wakil of the 12th Imam. كان المقربين منا من آل مثيل. الناس يرون يشوفون ذول العلماء اللي هم أقرب شيء إلى لابد أنه إذا من بعد يكون واحد منهم. يقول كان مريضا وحوله العلماء. يقول مح... جعفر ابن مثيل ومحمد وعلماء آخرين اللي هم بارزين ويراجعوهم الناس يقول هو قال أنه أمرني سيدي ومولاي أن أعهد وأوصي من بعدي لأبي القاسم الحسين ابن روح يقول كان قاعد هناك رأسا قام جعفر ابن متير وراح جابه قاعدة عند عند رأسه. During the Imamate of Hassan al-Askari, the eleventh Imam of the Shi'as, Abu Qasim Hussein, son of Ruh al-Nubakhti, was one of the Imam's chief companions. Hussein, son of Ruh, was a supporter of Abu Ja'far Muhammad ibn Uthman, the second special representative 
of Imam al-Mahdi, acting as a link between the second deputy and other Shia leaders. After the selection of al nawbakhti as the third special representative of the 12th Imam, he received the first Dawqir, or signed letter, by the 12th Imam on the 6th of Shawwal, 917 AD. The Dawqir reads as follows. We know Hussein ibn Ruh. May Allah confer all his goodness and pleasure on him and bestow his bounties on him. We are aware of his letter, which is the cause of our reliance and certainty upon him. We deem him meritorious, which makes him happy. May Allah increase his favours and goodness on him. <laughs> الحسين ولي الله أم لا قال نعم يزيد عدو الله قال نعم قال أخو كيف يصلت عدو على ولية كل شيء بيده قال يا هذا سألت فافهم الله عز وجل لما خلق الأنبياء والرسل وعطهم هذا المقام يمكن أن يملكهم الدنيا ويخليهم هم الغالبين ولكنه الناس تعبدهم من دونه فجعل هذا النظام جعلهم مرة غالبين مرة مغلوبين جعلهم يتمرضون جعلهم أجرى عليهم هذه القوانين الطبيعية حتى لا يعبدوا من دونه يقول أعجبني عجب رحت بيتنا يقول بيتنا فكرت أن هذا الجواب منا أو سمعه من الإمام المهدي سلام الله عليه يقول رجع الثاني يوم لما أقبلت إليه نظر إليه يعرف ما في نفسي قال يا هذا والله لأن أخر من شاهق أو تخطفني الريح فتهوي بي في مكان سحيق أحب إلي من أن أقول في دين الله برأيي The fourth wakil, Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari, hailed from a prominent and influential family in Basra, Iraq. Many members of his family served as agents of previous imams. Prior to the minor occultation, Al-Samri served as the deputy of Imams Al-Hadi and Hassan Al-Askari, the 10th and the 11th Imams of the Shia, respectively. During Al-Samri's period of deputyship, the Abbasids had conducted unprecedented crackdown against the Shia population of Iraq. As a result, Al-Samri assumed his role as deputy, secretly and inconspicuously, limiting his public interactions with the Shia faithful. سنة 329 أرسل وراء الشيعة علي بن محمد السمر رضوان الله عليه علماء شخصيات سعماء في ذلك المجلس قال لهم أنه هذا كتاب من سيدي ومولاي أقرأه عليكم كاتب له فيه يا علي ابن محمد السمري أعظم الله أجر إخوانك فيك إن على نفسه إنك ميت ما بينك وبين ستة أيام هذه علامة هذا سند فاجمع أمرك ولا تعهد إلى أحد يقوم مقامك من بعدك فقد وقعت الغيبة تامة حتى يأذن الله عز وجل بالظهور وسيأتي شيعتي من يدعي المشاهدة رح يجي لشيعتي من يدعي السفارة مشاهدة هنا بمعنى السفارة وليس الرؤية الرؤية ممكنة ولكن السفارة لا مشاهدة الحضور في مشهدة ألا ومن ادعى المشاهدة قبل الصيحة والسفياني فهو كذاب مفتر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. In the post-minor occultation period, 
the system of special representation underwent important changes that marked a new era for the Shia community. For the first time in history, the Shia imami community could not seek answers to its religious and social queries directly from a divinely appointed imam. This period began from the inauguration of the Prophet Muhammad, lasting until the final moments of the occultation in 941 AD. What had become apparent was the need to preserve the traditions and sayings of the Holy Prophet and Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt. Two luminaries rose to the task of preserving Shi'i heritage in the post-occultation period. Muhammad ibn Ya'qub al qulaini born in 941, and al sheikh al-Suduq, born in 991. al qulaini and al-Suduq took it upon themselves to start collecting the written notes of close companions of Imam Baqir and al-Sadiq. In Shi'i scholarly parlance, these notes are known as the Usul. We learn from multiple historical sources that the Shi'i preserved over 400 Usul going back to the times of the Imams. These Usul were crucial findings and formed the core material of Shi'i hadith canons such as Al-Kafi and Man La Yahdhur Al-Faqih. من أصحاب الإمام الصادق عندما ألفوا الكتب الحديثية أمثال كتاب حديث أمثال كتاب زرارة بن عين أمثال الأصول الكبيرة التي تركت المدرسة الكوفية آثارها. حديث collections like الكافي were based on the collection of these أصول. And to a certain extent that is true because when you look at the ones which are extant, they're not very many extant, but they overlap quite extensively with the early. Um, what we nowadays call the canonized um, corpus of hadith uh, from Kulaini, from uh, Sheikh Sadduq, from Sheikh Tusi. Qum was a center for the study of Shi'i traditions, and it was this form of religious learning to which Ibn Babaway adhered. Known today as Sheikh Sadduq, he was born and raised in Qum, a town about 125 kilometers southwest of Tehran in modern day Iran. As-Saduq was trained in the religious sciences by his father. His writings on creedal theology and jurisprudence went on to inform and influence future generations of Shia scholars. Because once the Ghaibah had happened, of course, there had to be some sort of justification for why to, this is the case, because people didn't know what was going on. And so there's, uh, at one level, this desire that there have to be um, narrations, from the Imams, ultimately from the Prophet, which demonstrate why there has to be a process, a period of occultation. Why is Ghaiba important? So, and that's expressed, uh, for example, in Sheikh Sadduq's um, Kamal al-Din, which still remains, I would argue, one of the best works which are written on the Ghaiba, why it's important, what sort of historical precedence does it have, and why is it a rational position to take. In the pre-occultation period, rationality as a mode of knowing and learning played somewhat a marginal role in Imami Shi'ism. In the presence of the Imam, there was little need to rely on rational reasoning to reach conclusions on religious questions. The Imams had certainly acted as guides to those with theological questions, based on laws which they themselves had issued directly. As such, Followers would refer to the Imams should they need clarification on various issues. However, in the absence of the Imam, problems emerged. With Imam al-Mahdi now in occultation, the question developed as to how one would obtain sufficient and justified knowledge of the truth. The problem was conflated when one understood that amongst the Imam's companions, there had existed difference in opinion with some attributing certain abilities to the Imams and others entirely disputing these positions. Sheikh Saduq was developing his ideas from some of the traditions that he had read. And he was a strictly, primarily I should say, a traditionist. And that does not mean that he never used any aql, but he was more focused on traditions. And sometimes he developed ideas which were found to be objectionable by either his peers, his students, and later imamis. So, for example, when you look at the Shiite creed, this has been translated into English now, Risalat al Tiqada, he talks of some traditions which can strictly be seen as anthropomorphic. 
God sitting on a throne, a throne which is carried by angels. Some of the views that uh, Sheikh Sadduq had espoused were highly objectionable. For example, uh, in his Man La Yahdhuruhu Al-Faqih, which is not a book of theology, it's a book of fiqh, but he says very clearly, and this is pertaining to theology, that the Prophet, na'udhu billah, had made a mistake or he did sahu in, in his prayers. Um, and this, which is a kind of an act of inadvertentness, that he was inadvertent, inattentive in his prayers. Now, if a prophet can do that, and Sheikh Sadduq insisted that this was a completely, genuinely true, authentic tradition, but that creates a lot of problems because it casts doubt on the isma of the prophet himself. And later scholars, of course, then uh, objected to it. Sheikh al-Sadduq became widely renowned for his writings, particularly Man La Yahdhur al-Faqih. In his introduction to the book, the author explains circumstances of its composition and the reason for its title, which translates to In the Absence of the Jurist. When he was based near to the town of Balkh, al-Sadduq met Sharif Ni'ma. He brought with him a book compiled by Muhammad al-Radi entitled Man la yahtharul tabib, or in the absence of the doctor, to the attention of Sheikh al-Sadduq. Sharif Ni'ma then asked him to compile a book on Islamic jurisprudence. This book would then be called Man la yahtharul faqih and would function as a work of reference in Shi'i legal studies. The development of the legal schools happening in Islam. Um, you know, you've got the development of legal schools, uh, particularly in Iraq at that time, uh, the um, the crystallization of what then become became later known as the Hanafi and the Shafi schools in a, a much more sophisticated manner, um, and so there was also a need to say, well, okay, if we are a particular school, we have a particular tradition, uh, which goes back to the Prophet, uh, then we need to demonstrate what our positions are on the sorts of issues that people debate, uh, and particularly we need uh, our own. Uh, adherents to know what these are because now we no longer have the Imams present and that's precisely why uh, Sadduq puts together Al-Faqih uh, with that in mind you know so that individuals might not necessarily have access to um, you know uh, learned in people who, who know certain things but if they have this text then they can follow what the Imams have taught us on matters relating to fiqh. Sheikh al-Sadduq passed away in the city of Ray, now known to be the southern region of Tehran. He had been invited to the city by Rukun al-Dawla of the Buyid family. Although he was treated well and with hospitality, his teaching was then restricted by the Buyid family official, Ibn Abad. The restraint appears to have been aimed at traditionalists in general, as several Sunni traditionalists suffered similar restrictions. The power of the Abbasids was increasingly and visibly weakening and there emerged within the Abbasid empire, within the realm controlled by the Abbasids, a number of dynasties, Persian dynasties um, particularly, um, chief among whom were the Buyids. Um, the Buyids, we are told according to some historical sources, had some Shi affinities. Other sources describe them as Zaydi Shias. So as you can imagine, they were sympathetic towards the Twelver community, which existed in significant numbers in Baghdad. In the year 945, the Buyid armies invaded Iraq and made Baghdad its capital. Their particular affection for Twelver Imamism allowed one of the leading Shia scholars to emerge and prosper, namely Sheikh al-Mufid. Al-Mufid lived in a period where the Mu'tazila a Muslim theological movement that based its approach on reason and rational thought had thrived and its teachings had become popular, especially in the city of Baghdad. Al-Mufid can be credited with being the first major Shia scholar to reverse the trend of textualism, attempting to introduce a much more rational framework into the school. In addition to being a fine faqih and a scholar of Asul al-Fiqh, Al-Mufid is most famously known for his robust debates against the members and scholars of other theological schools. 
The vast majority of his works are written as theological emendations or refutations of others. Biographical dictionaries of the scholars in Sunni Islam and history books describe how Al-Mufid was respected for being grounded in both Sunni and Shia scholarship. From his time onward, there is a, this great stress to prove or to validate, justify Shia beliefs, not only based on traditions, because these traditions would be acceptable to the Shias, but not to non-Shias. And therefore, they appropriated the tools of kalam, of uh, theology, to prove the beliefs in, for example, the oneness of God, the, the necessity of prophecy, the, the necessity of an imam, and some of the attributes of the imams also came under the scrutiny of uh, Shia theology. The belief in the is isma of the imams, the belief in the nas that the imam has to be appointed by the previous imam, the belief in the extraordinary knowledge of the imams, and even the belief in the 12th imam too. And Abay al-Maqalat is strictly a book of theology in which Mufid actually systematically mentions the views of the Ash'aris, of the Mu'tazilis, and even of other Shias, and even of the Nawbakhtis, for example. He either agrees with them, disagrees with them. On the question of, for example, whether the Quran was created or not created, now this was a major point during the time of Al-Ma'mun, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and even earlier than that. And the Mu'tazilis had insisted that the Quran was created in time. The Ash'aris, including Ahmad ibn Hanbal, had insisted that it was not, it was uh, infinite. The Shias came up and said, no, it was produced in time. Um, and on the question of uh, free will and predestination, you can see how very clearly here there is a cross-pollinization, fertilization of ideas. The Ash'aris are saying this, the Mu'tazilis are saying that, and the Shias are saying this. Whereas the Ashari says there was predestination, the Mu'tazili says there was free will, and the Shias come and say al-amru bain al-amrain, that the matter is in between two matters. There is some of some kind of um, jabr or predestination in some matters. There was also free will. One of the um, interesting um, debates that ensued at the time of Sheikh al-Mufid was how to understand the nature of the Imam. Um, prior to him, the school of Qom, the traditionists, um, held somewhat liberal views of the nature of the Imam. For some of them, the Imam was capable of forgetting. The Imam was capable of making inadvertent errors. The Imams, in some cases, were seen as little more very capable jurists. And the phrase they used was al-ulama al-abrar. He wrote a number of works criticizing Sadduq. He was familiar with Sadduq. Uh, for example, Sadduq has a creedal work, the Atiqadat, which is based very much on his sifting together of what the beliefs of the Imamiya should be based on what is available in Hadith. And um, Mufid found a lot of the issues that he put forward to be problematic because they were not rationally defensible. Um, there were other positions, of course, that Sadduq put forward which were certainly problematic, um, it's late, relating to the status of the Prophet and the Imams. Uh, one classic example was uh, Sadduq um, narrating um, hadith about how uh, the Prophet uh, might have forgotten in prayer, which of course detracted them from the very theological notion of the infallibility of the Prophet. What Al-Mufid went on to do is to provide Shi Islam with a theological identity that continues until the present. According to some historians, Al Mufid, as well as his student Sharif Al Murtada, used the theological tools to rely more on rationality in Shi'i theological arguments. It was merely taking the tools of the dominant kind of intellectual trends of that time and then adopting it to adapting it basically to uh, set up a, a rational system which was justifiable and could be justified and defended against those who did not accept your own views. I think we are talking of a culture where there was what we may call a lot of um, 
cross-fertilization and pollination of ideas, of tools. That Sheikh Mufid borrowed some tools, shall we say, from the Mu'tazilis is undisputable. Uh, what we do find is they were disputing and discussing with the Mu'tazilis. So, for example, many a time, uh, Mufid is responding to Qadi Abdul Jabbar, um, Sharif al Murtada is responding to Qadi Abdul Jabbar, and even Sheikh uh, Tusi, who comes later on, says, Well, they said this, but we said this. Although some of the work of Sheikh al Mufid shows that he may have used some of the rational tools of the Mu'tazila, he does not specifically state this. On the contrary, he refuted their logical deduction on many of their creedal positions. Needless to say, the rational tools used by al Mufid are engraved into the Shia tradition and have been used by the Imams during their time. When we read again from Imam Musa al-Kadhib there is a very profound letter from Imam Musa ibn Ja'far to Hisham ibn al-Hakam about the role of Aql. And all paragraphs start with Ya Hisham, Ya Hisham, Ya Hisham. He explains the role of Aql in giving the real understanding of religion and not sticking only or stopping by the text. Um, some Shia scholars have said the dictums of the Imams, the teachings of the Imams, take for example the compilation of Nahj al um, The first sermon whereby Ali ibn Abi Talib discusses God um, many people said that is an instance of a rational theological position where the Imam for example says those who point him confine him because and this is based on a theological argument that if you can point at something it must be sensible it must have dimensions if it has dimensions it is a body if it has a body it is a composite if it is a composite it's not simple and that is not what monotheism entails. So many have said the, the rational dimensions of the Mu'tazila can also be found in the dictums of the Imams. But what the Mu'tazilis did was to systemize it, was to present it in a coherent manner. Al-Mufid was the first to come up with what would later become the consolidated Usuli school's sources of law, namely the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Ijma of the Shia ulama, in addition to the intellect. Within the works of Sheikh al Mufid is the first real work on Asul al Fiqh amongst Shia scholars, entitled At Tadkira bi Asul al Fiqh. He also produced Al Muqni'a, applying the rational Asuli arguments to rewriting jurisprudence. Now, of course, in the later period, um, once uh, the Imams uh, were not present, and once there were issues about how do we make sense of all of these texts that have come down to us from the Imams, uh, there have to be some sort of processes of sifting through them and finding out which ones do have probative force, which ones do not, on which ones can we rely to understand what um, the uh, what the precepts should be with respect to the ritual law and to other aspects of the law, or what should we use to understand what even what the nature of the Imams was. All these processes required the adoption of certain types of hermeneutical tools for understanding these issues. And that, broadly speaking, then became later known as Ijtihad. The first book of Usul al-Fiqh that we have at our disposal now was written by Sheikh al-Mufid. A very short treatise. The original is not preserved uh, independently but we have in the Council of Mal uh, the aspects, or maybe even the whole of uh, Mufid's work. It's a short work, it's a short treatise. Later on developed by his students, one of the first one, of, of course, was uh, Sharif al-Murtada in his Dhariya, Ila Usul al-Fiqh, that the way or path off to Usul al-Fiqh, a two-volume work in which he developed some of the ideas of his teachers. Al-Mufid's most prominent student is the renowned Sharif al-Murtada, the brother of the compiler of the renowned work Nahj al-Balagha, Sharif al-Radi. Al-Murtada's greatest work of influence today remains his work 
Ashafi fil Imama, a work in which he had went head to head with the greatest Mu'tazili scholar of his time, by the name of Al Qadi al Jabbar, on the issue of Imamat of the Ahlul Bayt. His writings um, are celebrated, Ashafi fil Imama, uh, in modern print as two volumes, and two volumes devoted to countering the Mu'tazili rational argument against the 12 Imams, against the necessity of having 12 Imams, against the necessity of the Imam being infallible, against the necessity of electing an Imam, because there was a debate among the theologians, is Imam, is the concept or, or the idea of an Imam necessary? And if so, who elects the people? Is the Imam designated? And is it necessary at all times? Will there be conditions when the Imam is not necessary? The Mu'tazila's position is different to that of the Shi'i. It was Al-Sharif Al-Murtada who pushed forward the argument that there must always be an Imam, who pushed forward the argument that the Imam has to be designated, who was very critical of the idea of consensus as a means to elect an Imam. He was also very critical of those who said, whilst Ali was better, had more merit than Abu Bakr and Omar, um, the two, those first two, were nevertheless um, valid um, caliphs. He was critical of that type of argument, known as al Um So it's very interesting that the Baghdad school of Shi'i theology um, used rational tools championed by the Mu'tazila to counter the dominant theological position of the Mu'tazila. Initially, Sheikh al mufid and later his student Sayyid al murtada refused to accept Ahad Hadith, single-chain narrations, and instead insisted on accepting Mutawatir traditions, reports narrated by so many people that their gathering together upon a lie would be impossible. Some argue that this may be a reaction to the traditionalist school of Qum, embodied by Sheikh al Saduq. You can consider some of the narrations uh, for example, on the the walaya, the succession, the authority, the status of uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Imams to be mutawatir, but then there'll be lots of other little details which might not well be mutawatir. And then what do you do with some of the narrations about the Ghayba, which certainly were not mutawatir either? So there was a sense in which uh, the narrations which are had had to be accepted and normalized. It was part of the whole process of making in some ways, particularly the law, more flexible. The fewer texts you had, the more difficult it would be to actually make sense of what the law was. The successor to Sharif al murtada is of course none other than the Sheikh who had become known as the Sheikh of the school in scholarly circles, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Tusi, a polymath second to none in his time. Unlike his predecessors, Atusi did not necessitate that knowledge could only be reached through Mutawatir reports, but rather allowed acting upon isolated, authentic reports known as Ahad Hadith. Perhaps the greatest scholar that we have ever produced was Sheikh Atusi himself. Not only because of the depth of his knowledge, but also the breadth. You call that Sheikh Atusi was able to the and the Seljuk Empire was founded by a man called Tagril Beg in 1037. He united the Turkic warriors of the great Eurasian steppes into a confederacy of tribes who traced their ancestry to a single ancestor named Seljuk. He would later establish the Seljuk Sultanate after conquering Persia and retaking the Abbasid capital of Baghdad from the Boyid dynasty in 1055. <laughs> صارت مضايقات كبيرة للشيخ التوسي فأحرقت مكتبته أيضا وأحرق كرسي الكلام وهوجم فاضطر إلى مغادرة بغداد 
والمجيء الى النجف الاشرف شيخ الطوسي's influence would be so great that he is credited with founding the original Hawza of Najaf and more evidently is recognized by the Hawza as being the sheikh of the sect. كتاب النهاية في الفقه والفتوى وهذا الكتاب حقيقة هو إفتاء بمضمون الروايات كتاب المبسوط وهو يعني يعلن أو يصرح في مقدمة كتاب المبسوط يقول لقد اتهمنا خصومنا بأننا لا نفرع أي أن الفقه الشيعي ليس فقها اجتهاديا يفرع من الأصول وأراد أن يثبت خطأ هذه المقولة فكتب كتابه الشهير بالمبسوط الطوسي produced three out of five primary sources of رجال the science of analyzing the reporters of hadith namely الفهرست الرجال and finally his summary of Al-Kashi's Ma'rifatul Ar-Rijal in Asul Al-Fiqh. He produced the important work known as Al-Udda fi Asul Al-Fiqh. فإذا كان الشيخ المفيد قد وضع اللبنات الأولى فإن كتاب العدة في الأصول هو الكتاب الذي أسس فيه الشيخ الطوسي لمقولات منهجية تشتغل على عملية استنباط الحكم الشرعي. Without doubt, his most influential works, however, are Al-Astibsar and Al-Tahdhib Al-Ahkam, two works of narrations from the Imams, compiled by al tusi which have gone on to become two out of the four canonical hadith works of the Shia. Al-Tahdhib is a commentary on Sheikh Al-Mufid's book, Al-Muqni'a, covering all aspects of fiqh in the hadith format. عندما يقدم الفقيه ويجد أن هناك تعارض رواية تقول في الكراهة ورواية أخرى تقول بالاستحضار كيف يفك التعارض بين هاتين الروايتين عمد الشيخ الطوسي إلى تعريف كتاب الاستفصار في مختلف من أخبار فكان ما يسمى الحديث المختلف عند الإمامية أو اختلاف الحديث هذا وضع تنظيرا علميا للترجيح من الروايات فكانت الرواية التي توافق القرآن الكريم يأخذ بها والرواية التي توافق السنة المطهرة المتواترة يأخذ بها والرواية التي توافق الإجماع أو الرواية التي تأخذ توافق العقل فيأخذ بها. The school of Hilla began to thrive during the time of Ibn Adris al-Hilli, a descendant of Sheikh al-Tusi. Unlike the scholars who came before Ibn Idris, he did not agree with the fact that the views of Sheikh al-Tusi had come to such a degree that they remained largely unquestioned and unchallenged. Ibn Idris believed that there was a few fundamental flaws in the application of at methods in accepting narrations which were ahad, as singular, isolated reports. Instead, he opted to return to a more mufid and sharif al murtada like approach, which depended upon narrations which were mutawatir, and therefore provided certainty. His most famous works are his work Al-Sara'ir, a work of jurisprudence in which he offered his own fatawa and thus broke the long period of blind taqlid to the fatawa of Sheikh Al-Tusi. Some sources tell us that for about three centuries after the death of Abu Ja'far Al-Tusi, there was very little original innovation in Shi'i law. What people did was simply write commentaries on his writings, to write explications on his work, to write glosses, um, on his um, legal um, uh, writings. Perhaps one of the more important scholars to emerge in this era was a prominent scholar known as Al Muhaqqiq Al Hilli. He introduced a heavenly rational aspect into the realm of Imami scholarship and was very skeptical towards any form of taqlid to previous Shia scholars. This is as their fatawa was cited by ulama such as Al Tusi previously. It is under Al-Muhaqqiq Al-Hilli that the terminologies Al-Ijtihad and Qiyas, which were previously condemned heavily in the presence of the Imams, became prominent. Muhaqqiq Al-Hilli argued that both Al-Ijtihad and Qiyas as spoken of by the Imams referred to particular forms of illegitimate guesswork in opposition to clear-cut textual evidence. Whereas their usage in the absence of textual evidence and to a restricted degree, was not problematic, and on the contrary, produced probability, known as dhwan, a principle which would continue to be utilized amongst even contemporary scholars. 
through Al Muhaqqiq's vindication of the concept of Ijtihad. This led to the rise of the popular concept of Mujtahids, thus solidifying the role of the major scholar in Shia history. صاحب الشرايع امتاز بميزات ثلاث الميزة الأولى أنه استخلص كل التطورات الفقهية من الطوسي إلى عصره فأفاد منها في وضع ما سماه بالمتردد في اثنين تصنيف الجديد أو رصف الجديد للكتب الفقهية ثلاثة ادخال للاستدلال داخل الرسالة العملية Al Muhaqqiq's nephew is thought to have had an even greater impact upon the history of the Shia school than Al Muhaqqiq did himself, known as Alam al Hilli. He became known for several things, which caused him to be praised by many and tarnished by few. Firstly, Alam al Hilli considered the role of reason to be on par with that of revelation, and therefore introduced the concept of the jurist being the one who could rationally extract both theology and jurisprudence. Secondly, he is the first scholar credited with introducing the distinction in Shi'ism between Mujtahid and Muqallid and introducing the concept of the Muqallid being a sinner, accountable to God for not obeying the fatawa of a Mujtahid or seeking recourse to one. It is also interesting to note that it is Alam al-Hilli who is credited for introducing the systematic four-tier gradation of hadith authentication developed by his teacher Ibn Tawus. Prior to Alama and his teacher, scholars would either say a hadith was either authentic or inauthentic, but Al-Hilli introduced the four divisions of Sahih, Hasan, Mawathaq, and finally Da'if. لم يكتب لنا إلا المختلف فهذا يكفي أن يكون العلامة واضع لمدونة قانونية ما أخذ بنظر الاعتبار كل الآراء وكل أدلة الآراء ومحاكمة لكل الأدلة. The influence of Alam al-Hilli upon the Hausa and the Shia world remains indisputable, a scholar par excellence. His main influence remains in the world of usul, hadith sciences, fiqh and finally rational theology with his theological text known as the 11th chapter Al-Bab Al-Hadi Ashr remaining a rational theological text taught in the Hawza today. His most famous theological writings, Kashf Al-Murat, which was a commentary on a work written by his teacher, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. So the Kashf Al-Murat shows how in order to defend Shia positions on, say, God, prophethood, imam, one could make use of some of the rational arguments put forward, which had been put forward by um, other schools. Alam al-Hilli's introductions were not approved by all. In fact, there arose strict opposition to his rational introductions. In some circles, these critiques manifested as reactionary attempts to revive a non-rational form of Shia Islam loyal solely to the text. One such figure to develop the most prominent opposition movement to the introductions of Alam al-Hilli was the scholar known as Muhammad Amin al-Astarabadi who felt heavily disillusioned with the concept of Ijtihad and some of the rational reasoning invoked by the contemporary ulama of the Hawza. In reaction to what he perceived as the innovations of individuals like Al-Hilli, he wrote the Magnus Opus, which sparked the foundations of the Akhbari approach, known as Al-Fawaid Al-Madaniya, the Medinan intellectual benefits. The idea was simple, namely that the principles introduced by Ijtihad and rational deduction were merely dhvanni, i.e. probable, and lacked the certainty which knowledge required something which could only come through the source of revelation itself, namely the Imams. For people like Al-Astrabadi, only the narrations provided knowledge, and even the Qur'an alone couldn't be understood without the Imams as interpreters. Al-Astrabadi further critiqued the spread of the four-tier gradation of hadith authentication, and argued that the four books were authentic in and of themselves and that they did not require further grading, 
Rather, they themselves yielded certainty and could be acted upon. His methodology gained popularity in many scholarly circles, leaving a split between the Usuli scholars and the Akhbaris, which would last for a long period. They rejected uh, Ishtihad, they rejected the probative force of um, Ijma, they rejected the use, independent use of reason, and they were insistent that what we could know and practice and, and believe had to uh, result from the the akhbar had to result from the sayings and narrations of the imams not even the quran could be independent as a source because you have the development also of akhbari tafsir and for akhbari tafsir the quran could only make sense to us through the sayings of the imams the incorporation of usul al-fiqh of um, ishtihad and taqlid has actually given rise to dhan that is um, probability rather than yaqeen. Mullah Astarabadi feels that the truth lies not in usul al-fiqh, not in ijtihad, because they only produce possibility, some would say probability, not certitude. But the truth lies in the ahadith, in the akhbar. With Iran now under the reign of the Safavids, who had officially converted to Shi'ism, great Iranian scholars would rise amongst the Safavids, one being Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi. Majlisi chose to favour an Usuli-like stance towards clerical authority and hierarchy, but opting to take a more Akhbari approach towards issuing fatawa, in a way that he would prefer to accept traditions which more strict Usuli scholars would grade as weak. Al-Majlisi, of course, would go on to secure his name in the Shia archives of history, through the compilation known as Bihar al-Anwar, a magnus opus encyclopedia gathering all narrations, great and small. Bihar al-Anwar was something which would go on to become an important resource for many, spanning 110 volumes. The nature of scholarship after Alam al-Majlisi remains somewhat conflated between the Usuli and Akhbari approaches, with it being hard to distinguish between the two methodologies at times due to many scholars selecting and implementing aspects from both approaches. Al-Wahid al-Bahbahani was a strong advocate of Usul al-Fiqh. He was a strong advocate in promoting the role of reason as a tool to help us derive law. And he fought Akhbarism in the southern regions of Iraq, particularly in Karbala, where he was um, active and Karbala was the center of Shi'i learning at the time, not Najaf. And his most famous rival uh, was al-Bahrani and their students. Sheikh al-Bahbahani managed to restore confidence in usul al-fiqh after a period of dominance whereby Akhbarism came to define how one should derive law. The system and structure we have today has gone through rigorous adaptation. Every generation that passes examines and scrutinizes the ideas of previous generations, employing new tools and building on prior works. It is interesting to note the merging of ideologies which were once so polarized. Be it in the creedal doctrines or jurisprudence, there has been a continuous evolution of Shia thought.